strategic fighting is boring, man. I don't want to be tactical. I want to go out there and get submissions, baby. I want to be the guy that does the Nicky Ryan entry right in front of Nicky Ryan. And after I win, he's going to be the one raising my hand. Nobody wants to watch two people sitting in closed guard trying to get an advantage to win the match. As an exciting jujitsu practitioner, what I strive for is to have an answer for every reaction my opponent gives. You do a position and your partner will give you a reaction to defend your position. So it's up to you to have an answer to your react uh, to the partner's reaction. So if I enter into the legs and try and spin to inside Senkaku, but it doesn't work. So the next time I'm gonna try a toe hold. And if they don't react to the toe hold, I'm gonna switch to the knee bar. But if they do react to the toe hold by spinning, they're gonna land right in my inside Senkaku. So we as Jiu Jitsu practitioners are constantly looking for better answers to our opponent's responses and it never ends. And when we hear words like strategy and tactics, sirens go off in our head because our goal is submission. But what if I told you that in chess, tactics and strategy are two very different things? Now, I definitely didn't know the difference between tactics and strategy, and I especially didn't know how they interact with one another to make a very exciting style. So I wanna thank my podcast partner, Josh, for introducing me to this idea because I know nothing about chess. But I do know that a huge buzzword being thrown around the jiu-jitsu world right now is dilemma and the idea behind it is we put our opponent in a position where if they don't do anything we're going to arm bar them and if they come up into us they're going to fall into a triangle so they're really stuck between a rock and a hard place another example could be that our opponent is doing a good job of hiding their chin from a cross face but it exposes them to the half nelson or if there are points involved, we could be put in a position where either we accept a takedown and give our opponent points, or we give up our back. And it turns out this is actually very common in chess, where we use one piece to attack two of our opponent's pieces. Putting them in a dilemma, or in chess, they refer to it as a double attack. And a double attack is what chess people refer to as a tactic. Another very common tactic in chess is the idea of a pin where you cannot move your knight in this situation because if you do, you're going to expose your king. So effectively, I have pinned your knight in place. And the whole idea behind jujitsu is built around this tactic of pinning, where if I'm able to get to a very dominant pin like mount, movement on your part can be very detrimental and lead to the end of the match. So tactics are the one-two combos, the sequences, the moves that we practice in jujitsu that lead to all of the submissions. And there are a lot of people that have built a career off of tactics and practice the sequence so much that they can get it to work against practically anyone. And when you log into your BJJ365 account or sub meta and you study all of these techniques, what you're most likely learning are tactics, which is great. Nobody loves tactics more than me. And I can't believe I'm saying this, but after learning a little bit about chess, I agree with the famous quote that tactics are the servant of strategy. And if you're willing to hear me out and stick with me throughout this video, I think you're gonna find that strategic fighting can be very entertaining. Shh. Chess is 90% tactics, and it's the most important thing, as every game comes down to tactics. This is music to my ear hair. Because a lot of jujitsu people have a very good idea of tactics, and we train them all the time. In chess, they have games to practice the tactics of the end game, so you can understand sequences that you can use to finish your opponent. And as an athlete that focuses on submissions, I also want to put a huge emphasis on studying the tactics of the end game. So if we have someone like Dane Leak who falls to the underhook side and brings his foot to Max's hip, but Max is able to quickly turn and free himself from the back position. So if we're able to understand the tactics of the end game, the next time we take the back, we're not going to bring our foot to his hip and we're going to leave it in as a hook because that's going to carry us with him and allow us to stay connected as he rolls aggressively, which ultimately ultimately leads to us winning the match. And when it comes to recognizing tactics in chess, a huge emphasis is placed on defense, where if you're able to recognize tactics being used against you, you can defend them and ultimately use them yourself. And this again falls in line perfectly with Danaher's idea that you should begin your study with defense. 
Now we've covered a couple, but there are so many tactics that chess players use. There's the tactic that if both your queen and your knight have their king in check, even though your opponent is in position to take your queen and to take your knight, they cannot do both of those things at the same time which means that your pieces are safe and your opponent's only option is to move their king. I think this is very similar to the jujitsu idea of inside position versus inside control. If you're able to win inside position and take the underhook, it doesn't mean anything if I'm able to put you flat on your back because now you have no ability to control me with that inside position. So sure, yes, you might be in position to take my queen, but you're not able to use that position because I have control. Another tactic in chess is sacrifice, where you give your opponent something in order to open up opportunities for yourself. And a lot of times people in jujitsu will sacrifice their foot to their opponent so they can counter with a leg lock of their own. Not trying to be a dick, but I was like letting him get pretty deep so that I could counter. And Another example of this tactic being used is from Butterfly Half Guard, where our knee in their shoulder acts as a great guard retention tool, but also prevents us from entering into attacks of our own. So often we're going to have to let our opponent beat our knee and get a little closer to passing our guard in order to set up our attacks. Another good example of this is if we're having a hard time getting a hold of our opponent and forcing them to engage, it might be a good idea to let them get an advantage, let them get some form of inside position because they're more likely to engage if they have some sort of advantage. And once they engage, you now have the ability to go into your attacks. Another very interesting idea in chess is the tactic of counterattacking with danger levels. Now in chess, each piece has a starting value assigned to it, where the rook is five, the knight and bishop are three, and the queen is nine. Nine. And the idea is if you're attacking my knight and I'm able to put your queen in jeopardy, you're not willing to take my three point piece if it means sacrificing your nine point piece. So you respect my threat on your queen and I'm able to move my knight to safety. And I'm sure a lot of you are probably like, oh yeah, that's when someone's trying to pass your guard and then you throw up a buggy choke. And yeah, they might pass your guard, but you also might finish the match. And because your threat carries a lot more weight behind it, they respect it and back out. So these are a handful of tactics that I think a lot of jujitsu people can understand and relate to. But strategy is where things start to get a little murky and we start to lose those jujitsu athletes that pride themselves in hunting for submissions. Because when you talk strategy, you inevitably have to talk about rule sets. And we love the idea of someone who is so good at tactics that it doesn't matter the rule set, it doesn't matter the size discrepancy, they're going to go out and they're going to submit you. That's just my game. But unfortunately for the majority of us, we got to look in the mirror and realize that our tactics really aren't that good. And it's not realistic for us to expect them to work against every opponent. Now, when we throw around the idea of strategy, it makes us think about someone curled up in a ball for two hours. And that is just the worst nightmare from a fan's perspective. So when I quote the famous chess master and say that tactics are a servant of strategy, please know that adding that 10% of strategy to your 90% of tactics is meant to make you a more exciting and successful grappler. Now the biggest difference between tactics and strategy is that tactics create a dynamic advantage while strategy creates a static advantage that is more long term. A tactic is something that gives you a very brief advantage that can result in you taking a piece away from your opponent or it can result in nothing depending on how it plays out. But all of the tactics you employ are working towards a strategy. And a simple strategy in chess is to control the center of the board because now you have have so many more moves available to you. So the strategy of controlling the center of the board gives you a long-term advantage. Now, if we take a look at Maisa here, who's entering into K guard, and I think we can all agree that she has a temporary advantage from this position, but Brianna is able to successfully defend and reset the situation. So then Maisa says, okay, I'm gonna use a dilemma here. I'm gonna enter into K guard, and as you try and stop my entry, I'm gonna go into an arm bar. And then as you defend my arm bar, I go back into K guard, but that doesn't work either. So Maisa says, okay, I trust in my tactics. And I've practiced this a lot. So we're gonna go K guard, and then we're going to try the arm bar and if that doesn't work we switch to De La Hiva. But again it doesn't really amount to anything and that seemed to be the story of the match. Where Maisa was throwing a lot
lot of tactics at Brianna, but those tactics were not working towards a strategy. She wasn't using tactics to work to control the center of the board. She was using tactics, hoping that Brianna wouldn't have answers to those tactics and she was gonna be able to finish the match. But Brianna was able to successfully defend, counter, take the back and win the match. Now compare that to Jed facing Alan Sanchez. And we have to consider the rules when we're talking about strategy and the rules for this match are that takedown, sweeps, mount, back, anything counts for one point. So with that in mind, we see Jed pull guard. And from there, he starts to initiate a K guard attack, which Alan defends but Jed uses it as an opportunity to come up on top and get a point. So Jed used the tactic of K-Guard and chased the submission. But if the submission failed, he made sure that that tactic moved him closer to controlling the match and developing a more long-term advantage. When you compare this to Alan Sanchez, who also enters into the legs, but as Jed defends, Alan has no sense of urgency to get back that point and control the center of the board. So now Alan stands and Jed sits down and we reboot the system. We're Alan respects Jed's leg entry so he sits down leaving an opportunity for Jed to wrestle up and get another point point. and again we see Alan trying to use tactics to enter into the legs but there's no strategy behind those tactics they're not working towards anything other than a submission so now when it fails Alan's standing Jed sits down again and now because Jed has firmly controlled the center of the board Alan has his back up against the wall at this point a little bit and he's got to start taking a little more risk and as he starts reaching to pass the guard and keep his legs safe, Jed uses the arm saddle position to take the back. So I think you get the point. This was not a boring match. This match had a lot of action between two very high level grapplers. Alan Sanchez beat Oliver Taza to win the EBI event not too long ago. But this match, I believe, is the perfect example of how tactics without strategy behind them is not going to work consistently at the highest level. And I get that some of you are still a bit skeptical because this match involved points. But listen to Cole talk about his strategy heading into his W and O match that involved no points. I was able to make him sit down. Down, uh, multiple times threatening the leg attacks and then uh, was trying to expose the hips whenever I came on top. So Cole felt that if he was able to control Damien's hips he was going to have a long-term advantage in this match and the tactics he used to get there were leg entries. You see him use a beautiful K-guard entry to threaten the legs. And this tactic forces Damien to bring his hips lower to the ground to defend. So the tactic of K-guard did not result in a submission, but it did move Cole closer to his strategy of getting control over Damien's hips. This time, instead of K-guard, Cole uses a different tactic of the false reap. And again, this is a dilemma here. If you don't respect my false reap, it can lead to a submission. But if you do respect it and bring your hips to the ground, sure you defend the submission, but because I have a strategy behind my tactics, I'm able to move towards that strategy and control the center of the board. And using tactics and strategy in this manner does not sacrifice excitement for you to be successful. So I think we get by now that our tactics need to have a long-term goal behind them, which is a strategy. But this is where things get really, really interesting. Because in chess, a strategy does not necessarily have to lead to positional change. And this is something I'm really trying to understand myself. So I'm hoping I can explain it in a way that we can relate it to jujitsu and learn from it because I think Gordon is doing this and we're not. So like we talked about previously, each piece has a value assigned to it. And the knight and the bishop both have a starting value of three. However, as the game plays out and we get closer to the end and we find ourselves in a position like this where it's a bit congested. So the black bishop in this scenario doesn't really have a lot of places to move, but the white knight has the ability to jump over all of this congestion, giving it tons of options. So although the bishop and the knight started out at three points and although white and black have the exact number of pieces on the board and the only difference is white has a knight and black has a bishop. The the knight now has way more value than the bishop because of the layout and their position on the board. And again, I'm still kind of thinking through how to relate this to jujitsu, but I think it's a very powerful concept. And I think the basic idea is that Gordon is constantly threatening positional advancement. So if you don't do anything, he's going to take control of the center of the board and beat you. So you have to respect it. And when you do, it creates a situation where Gordon can decide the sacrifices he wants to make. And he can constantly sacrifice position, which is a 
tactic that he calls backtracking. And while he is sacrificing his position, you're sacrificing your endurance. And he's constantly using tactics like this to move towards the strategy of creating an end game situation where the tools you have are pretty much useless. And the tools he has are at their full strength. So after a 45 minute match with Gordon Ryan, even though you still have good attacking pieces on the board, Gordon uses tactics to work his way to a position where you can't even use your pieces effectively. And it's this strategy that makes you feel like there's no hope and no point in continuing. And just like in chess and go where it's polite to resign when you know it's over. White, oh, he resigned. That's exactly what Penna did. Now, I know it got a little bit abstract there towards the end, but the main message I wanted to get across in this video is that you should keep developing your skills, keep studying instructionals, and keep hunting submissions. But at the same time, if there's no strategy or long-term vision behind these tactics, then when you face good people who have the ability to defend your attacks, you're either going to lose or it's going to result in a match where you and your opponent are just firing attacks off at one another and no one is able to achieve a significant advantage. Advantage. Someone attacks, the other guy defends, they both back out. Mm -hmm. We haven't seen any solid positions yet. Be sure to like and subscribe if you've learned a little bit about chess and how it relates to jujitsu, and we'll see you in the next video.